This morning, we're in the Gospel of John, and Peter uh, will be speaking to us from John chapter 6. I'm just going to read a few verses from John chapter 5 as we start our time this morning, as we're going to pick up a particular theme, uh, both in our worship uh, and Peter in his speaking. Um, in John chapter 5, we have been uh, hearing a conversation going on between Jesus and the leaders, uh, the religious leaders of his day. Uh, many of them were part of the Pharisees as well as others who were part of the leadership of Israel at that time. Uh, he had healed a, a man on the Sabbath day, and uh, that had led to the question of uh, what could and couldn't be done on a Sabbath. And, and when in chapter 5, verse 17, uh, they went to speak to Jesus about instructing a paralyzed man to pick up his bed and walk on the Sabbath day, Jesus said some incredible words, and we were reflecting on them in the Tuesday uh, life group. Verse 17 of chapter 5, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And uh, we were reflecting on, on Tuesday that, in a sense, he, he made the situation worse. He was explaining why he was working on the Sabbath, or at least asking somebody to do something, a healed man to carry his bed home, having been healed on the Sabbath. And in answering the question, in his defense, Jesus said, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And that, of course, led to an even more uh, difficult conversation. In fact, it says in the next verse that they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And it's that thought that's been uh, on my mind and heart since Tuesday or really through this week, that this we, we are at this point as a church, as we look through the Gospel of John, we're at this point where Jesus is making claims about himself that are mind-blowing. And they were mind-blowing for the leadership of that day. And the only thing they could conclude was we need to kill him because he is blaspheming. He is making himself equal to God. But we come together this morning uh, with a, a realization and, a, and an understanding of who Jesus is that, that we believe is correct, but at the same time is mind-blowing. The, the, the idea that Jesus and the Father, God, the Son and the Father, that the relationship between Jesus is as intimate and as close as that as a son to a father. Jesus goes on, uh, I'll read a little bit more at the end of chapter 5. He goes on to discuss about, well, who is the witness? Who is the testimony about who Jesus is? Uh, and in verse 31, he says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. I mean, we can't testify about ourselves. Other people need to testify. But he says, there is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that, uh, uh, that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, that's John the Baptist, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it, that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy the light. So he said, John was actually a witness uh, to this truth. Then he says in verse 36, I have a testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. And later this morning, Peter, speaking from chapter 6, is going to uh, take us to a couple more of those works that Jesus was doing that testify that the Father had sent him. And the Father, verse 37, has, who sent me, has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, that's God, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them they have eternal life, but these are the very scriptures that testify about me. So the word of God, the scriptures that we read also give testimony to who uh, Jesus is. Verse 45 
But do not think that I will accuse you before the Father, because they were rejecting his testimony. Jesus said, do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? The next uh, two songs that we're going to sing uh, speak of God in all his awesomeness and at the same time relating that to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we have come together this morning to worship. But they're also going to draw on that amazing story of Moses, uh, which for the Jewish people was so central to their thinking. And the way that God came down and got Moses to rescue his people from Egypt, waiting as they were for deliverance, waiting for hundreds of years for deliverance, uh, God sent Moses. And that same Moses, Jesus said, who rescued your people from Egypt is the one who spoke about me and testified to who I am. Let's join together and sing uh, these two songs of worship.
heaven, we, we worship you this morning. We are humbled in your presence that we should be able to come directly into your presence. Thank you, Father, that the way has been open for us, that we can come straight into your presence, only made possible through the death of your beloved Son on Calvary's cross. And Father in heaven, we want to worship you for sending your one and only Son so that we might enjoy an unbroken relationship with you, almighty God. We thank you for the privilege that we have this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you, Father, know that you are a great God, almighty God, but we, as your creatures, can approach you directly. And our hearts are, are humbled in your presence. And we worship you, Father, for that awesome truth. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As we were waiting without hope few minutes to reflect uh, further on this uh, towards communion uh, and to sharing bread and wine which reminds us of this incredible truth that that God the one God the supreme God uh, who came to Moses and said those incredible words I have seen the suffering of my people and I am come down to rescue them such personal words in a sense I have come down to rescue them uh, then as we know turned to Moses and said to Moses go and rescue uh, my people uh, from Egypt it was Moses uh, who said those words that Jesus is referring to and I'm going to read them in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that that after 40 years of struggling, uh, you could say, with the people of God. Um, Moses comes towards the end of his life. So in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, is where Moses says these words, because Jesus, as we just read there briefly in chapter 5, said, uh, it's Moses who will condemn you if you don't believe in me, because Moses spoke about me. Where, where did Moses speak about Jesus? Well, the most certain passage and clearest passage is Deuteronomy chapter 18. And I'm just going to read those words. Uh, after 40 years, and, and, and we know why it took them 40 years to get to the land of Canaan. It was because of uh, unwillingness to trust God. An unwillingness to actually believe 
that the God of miracles, the one that we've sung about, the vast God, creator of the universe, who had intervened in time and space and had rescued them out of Egypt with some incredible miracles of both the, the plagues in Egypt, but the, the parting of the Red Sea uh, and the pres preserving, looking after them for 40 years. They had, because of their unwillingness to trust and actually trust and do, trust and do what God asked them to do, had spent 40 years, a whole generation lost in the wilderness. At the end of that time, Moses says these words in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow, fellow Ill Israelites. You must listen to him. I think that was a personal testimony of somebody who had been speaking the words of God for 40 years or more, and people had not listened to him. Uh, he said, God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let's not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his great fire anymore, or we will die. The people recognized that God was that awesome that to come close to him was dangerous. So God said, okay, I'll send a prophet. Verse 17, the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. And I want you to just, just reflect on those incredible words from where we were in chapter five last week. Uh, God said, uh, I, I, he that is the one I will send will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the, the prophet speaks in my name. And I know that passage is used uh, to talk about prophets generally, but it's very clear that Moses was saying to them, one day God will send another one who will do a rescue, who will do something that is similar or that is reflected in what Moses himself had done. And as we continue this morning to reflect through that second hymn that we sung there, recognizing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father sends the Son. And in some of the, those words that we were singing together to, to reveal the kingdom coming, to reconcile the loss, redeem the whole creation. To do that, you did not despise the cross. And for a few moments this morning, let, let's draw our hearts to the very heart of what Jesus Christ did for us in coming into our world, in being the prophet, in being the one who is going to speak the very words of the Father to us. He will tell us everything that God has commanded him it wasn't just words that Jesus brought, but he brought himself as the word of God. We're learning a bit of that in the Gospel of John. And the word of God, which was to deliver and to rescue humanity, was going to have to do something incredibly deep, personal, painful, and costly in giving his life for our sakes and the very disobedience that had gone on with Israel right up to that time and our disobedience and our unwillingness to submit ourselves to who God is and who we really are is, is the sin that separates us. And as we take bread and wine this morning, we reflect once again that God came himself personally, not now asking a Moses, but himself personally to deliver his people and to do that involved going uh, to the cross. Go to pray and we'll share uh, the bread and wine together and take these moments to give thanks. Uh, I'll pray, but you give thanks. It is a, both a collective thanksgiving for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said on the, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and said, this 
is my body, who took the cup and spoke those words. This is the new covenant in my blood. And as we share these things and eat them and drink them together, to give thanks collectively and personally for what God has done to deliver us. Let's pray. Father, as we take these simple symbols uh, of our common foodstuffs, bread and wine, and as we take them, recognizing their significance, Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful to have a God such as you. We know there is no other God, and so we're profoundly grateful that you as God are the love and grace and mercy held in justice and holiness that you are. We give thanks that you were willing to give yourself in the way that you did so that we could receive life and live life and indeed live with eternal life. We give thanks for this bread and we give thanks for these cups and we share them in gratitude as we individually express appreciation again to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
feeds the 5,000. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who were ill. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they, all, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus walks on the water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat, boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Jesus, the bread of life. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, where did you get, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you want, not because you saw the sign I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they said, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works of, that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe in you. What will you do? 
Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. Good morning. I hope you feel very welcome this morning. I mean, I think most people here know who I am, but uh, I'm Pete, I work for the church. And um, before we start, um, it's important for us to, uh, to, to realize that we want God to speak to us. We don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from God. So please do keep your Bibles open. Uh, I'll be referring to the passage uh, we've just read. Uh, thank you for, for reading that. And, um, and we'll be looking at some other bits around it. Right, I've got a question for you. And perhaps this is a bit of a strange question, but hit, bear with me. What do Islam, Storm Eunice and baking have in common? There we go. That's my question for you. The answer is this sermon. If they seem a little bit disparate, bear with me, bear with me. Not wishing to be flippant, but the events in these verses at first seem a little unrelated, don't they? Uh, Jesus first feeds 5,000 people. He then walks on water and then he says he's bread. If that isn't strange, and if you don't think that's strange, perhaps you're very familiar with Christian things, which is in, in, indeed likely if you've been a Christian for a while. So wherever you're at this morning, I want you to be sure that this passage is what you need. This is what we need to hear this morning. Now, Paul, um, Mark has helpfully summarized a bit of what's gone before, but let's have a, a little look at a few other verses from chapter five. Um, before we get to, into our passage, it would be really helpful to have a little look at them. Um, so last Sunday, we, we looked at some of this, but um, uh, it was Charles, wasn't it? Charles spoke mainly on the first 30 verses of chapter five, which is a big section anyway. Um, and it speaks mainly about Jesus's authority, as Marcus said. In verse uh, 534, Jesus says, he speaks truth about himself to his hearers so that you, they, may be saved. So Jesus wants people to be saved. And in 536, he goes on to say, the works that the Father has given me, Jesus, to accomplish are, are the very works that I am doing and bear witness about me that, that the Father has sent me. So he's saying the things he does actually say who he is. They say that he's from God. So the things Jesus does point to who he is. So that begs the question, what does Jesus do, doesn't it? Um, well, our passage gives us two signs, two works that Jesus does, at least two. Um, and Jesus then repeatedly talks about how the people do not listen to himself. Again, Mark mentioned this. Um, it, the people don't listen to what he, his, he says or his father says regarding himself. And that might beg the question to anybody listening or anyone here, do we, do you listen to what Jesus says? Do you believe in him? Do you do what he says? That's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Now, the question that would summarize all of these things is, is who is Jesus? And I think that is the question that this whole section is saying. And the answer to that is Jesus is the prophet, firstly. He is the I am, the Lord. And he is the bread of life. That's what the passage seems to say, isn't it? So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to believe in Jesus. We're to listen to him because he provides what we really need. He gives us rescue and eternal life. So just a bit more about John. At the start of John, we had in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Right at the start of John, didn't we? He, is, he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. Uh, obviously talking about Jesus as we might be familiar he goes on to say for the law was given through Moses in verse 17 of chapter one grace and truth 
came through Jesus Christ. Later in the same chapter, Philip says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law, also the prophets, uh, wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And soon after that, Nathanael sends, says to Jesus, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. All through John, we get, we get told who Jesus is. Do we listen? Are we hearing what it says? In John's gospel, we, John also speaks about signs. Now, I think we've had this mentioned before. He says signs, not miracles. Uh, but John is not so interested in the miracle. He is more interested in the meaning. Um, so we should, we should be too, shouldn't we? Um, there are at least seven of these signs, uh, these miracles that Jesus performs that deliberately highlight and focus on him. They want us, he wants us to see them. So the first one was back in chapter two. John, where he turned in, in, in chapter two of John, where he turns water into wine at the wedding at Cana. The second came in chapter four, when Jesus healed the official's son. And the third we had, we touched on last week, and certainly in the Bible study on Tuesday in chapter five, when Jesus healed the paralyzed man at the Bethesda, Bethsaida pool in Jerusalem. Um, you see, Jesus' signs have significance now that would work if we pronounce significance the same way but it doesn't quite work uh, they point to who jesus is the son of god the messiah now in the letter that john wrote we have this repetition of the word believe it's mentioned like some 90 times but what does john want us to believe why did he write this in chapter 20 verse 31 john tells us why he wrote the book he says these are written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Then by believing, you can have life through his name. So that was a bit of an overview of John. Let's, let's get into this, this, set, this passage. So my first point is Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the prophet like Moses who provides abundantly. In the first section of our passage in 1 to 15, Jesus miraculously feeds 5,000 people, performing his third, sorry, his fourth sign. Um, so almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus is back in the, the region of Galilee in northern Palestine, over on the eastern side of the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Um, sea of Tiberias is probably the official Roman name. Um, and he's up a mountain, possibly the Golan Heights, um, kind of on the disputed border, border of Syria today. Um, I think Alice probably knows, she was in Israel, weren't you, a bit? Uh, <laughs> and um, we're, time, we're told what time of year it is, verse four, it was a Passover, which probably means it's around March, April time. Uh, and we, we firstly, we get this in, in verse one, it says, after this. And this signifies a big leap forward in time, uh, perhaps as much as half a year from what has happened in chapter five, which was in Jerusalem. We've had a big sea, scene change. Um, now, I don't know if you noticed, but there are quite a number of things in this section that if you know the Bible a bit, should be tweaking our interest. Um, look, at, look at what happens. There is a, a crossing of a sea. There is a large crowd. There is going up a mountain. The, the Passover is mentioned for the second time in John. Uh, and all of these details are reminiscent of Moses and the Exodus the rescue from slavery in Egypt some 1,300 years before. And these details keep on coming through the section. Uh, Jesus lifts up his eyes like Moses did uh, when the people of God received manna from heaven when they were in the wilderness. Uh, then we get to verse 5, where Jesus asks slash tests Philip, which was appropriate as Philip was a local. He's from uh, just down the road. Um, and Jesus asks him, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Good question. He's asking the right person. And then in six, it says, Jesus knew what he would do. So he's asking for a, as a test, which is quite interesting. Uh, we then get an, understa an understanding of just how great the crowd is, as we are told in verse seven, that we would need 200 denarii. Um, now, I've been working from the ESV translation, so if there's any slight differences, apologies, that's me. Now, I have a flaxen of a denarius there. There you go. You can have a look at that later if you want. It's got the emperor on it. Um, so 200 denarii 
that would be, as it says, I think here, about half a year's wages. I think it's more like eight months, I think Mark says. Um, and it's considered a, a fair day's wage, wage for a labourer. So if we kind of approximate that to the UK in 2022, that's about 15, 16,000 pounds worth of food. The disciples clearly don't have enough money uh, to buy that much food to feed the people. So this sets up the problem, doesn't it? And then Andrew in verse eight, what does he do? He finds a poor boy with his packed lunch, uh, five barley loaves, two fish, a humble meal. And it's clearly pathetically small amount, isn't it? Um, for that amount of people, not enough food. What's going to happen? Well, we're, we're familiar with this, so we all know, don't we? Well, most of us do, I'm sure. Uh, then in verse 10, in another more reminiscent, uh, another move reminiscent of Moses, Jesus asked them to sit down. Mark's gospel tells us in 50s and 100s, uh, this is again, this is like the Pentateuch. This is like the Old Testament with Moses. And at this point, we see the scale of the catering problem. Now, I don't know anyone into catering. If you've had to deal with a wedding, that's probably about the biggest number of people you're going to have to deal with. And the catering is often the biggest thing in your budget. It's, it's, it's a bit of a headache, causes a lot of stress. Um, I'm sure most of us haven't been at weddings this big, but there are 5,000 men, we're told, which means including the women and children, we could be looking at as many as 10, 20,000 people. This is a festival-sized catering problem. And in verse 11, Jesus gives thanks for the food again, just like Moses uh, did when he received manna from heaven. As an aside, I was struck by this as I was preparing. Um, perhaps this is a, a good application for us that in busy London, we should take time to be thankful for all that the Lord gives us. Um, this is often Jesus' example. And I've realized that I need to change my attitude to breakfast because I often don't give thanks for breakfast, and I should. So I need to apply that to myself. Perhaps you have a similar problem, but we should be thankful for every single bit of food we get, as well as every other good gift God gives us. So after everyone has, eat, has eaten, they gather in 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Jesus has supplied all their physical needs. Why is that? Because Jesus is the prophet, like Moses, who provides abundantly. Hopefully you see that. So Jesus has miraculously fed 5,000 people with just five loaves, two fish. It's amazing. But why does Jesus do it? I mean, it's amazing, but why does Jesus do it? That should be the question we're asking. John gives us these signs because they have significance, because they have meaning. It's not just a miracle. He's teaching us something. What, what is it? Why does John tell us this? In fact, why do all four Gospels tell us this? This is the, the only miracle other than the resurrection that is in all of them. This, this wonder, this sign, why is it here? Um, why do his followers want us to know this? Why does John want us to know this? Perhaps you're still thinking, what's that link with Islam? Well, it might be a distraction, but in Islam, the claim is that Jesus is just a prophet, isn't it? One in a long line, and that he is nothing more than a prophet. That is the claim, as I understand it. I'm not overly familiar with Islam, but that's the basic claim. Is that true? Is Jesus just a prophet? Who is Jesus? Does Islam have it right? Well, look down at verse 14, which says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So the people who witnessed the miracle seemed to think Jesus was a prophet. Not conclusive, but interesting. Does this mean Islam's right? Good question. Let's keep going. What's the next thing they do? In verse 15, they try to take him by force and make him king. Right. So they think Jesus is the prophet, and they try to make him king. Interesting. And Jesus realizes this, and in the fading light, he removes himself from the situation to a place away from everyone, up a mountain. Again, slightly familiar, uh, reminiscent of Moses. So what, why do the people want to make Jesus king? Well, because he can, he can help them with their physical needs. He could feed them. They want a king who's going to look after them. You know, we, we all would. Now, does any of that seem strange to you? I, I think it is a bit peculiar, and there's some strange things going on. 
Uh, later in John 6, we're going to see a bit more about what Jesus is talking about. So let's go back to this thought of a prophet. You see, the prophet they're speaking of isn't just any prophet. As, as Mark has said, 3,300 years ago for us, Moses said this in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. A few verses later, the Lord speaking to Moses said this. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Later in Acts 3, Peter confirmed that Moses was speaking about Jesus, saying in 22, um, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in, in, in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. These are big claims. Stephen goes on to talk about it again as well. So after Jesus has, has fed 5,000 people, the people have eaten this miraculous meal, seem convinced of Jesus that he is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. He is this prophet that Moses spoke about who is greater than himself. And later Peter and Stephen confirmed that Jesus is this prophet. So Jesus is the prophet that is being spoken of, perhaps not the prophet Islam is speaking of. We should respond to him by listening to his words. That's what we're challenged to do. We're to listen to Jesus. He is clearly to be listened to. So what does he say? And, and do we listen to his words? So just to be clear, Jesus is the prophet, like Moses, who should be listened to. So listen to him. That's what we're to do. Do we listen to Jesus' words? Now, Jesus is the prophet that's come into the world, who's like Moses, who would feed and lead them. So Islam is sort of right. Jesus is a prophet, but that's not all he is, is it? Jesus is so much more than just a prophet. He's the son of man. He's God himself. And that leads us to our next section. And, and my second point uh, from 16 to 21, Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the Lord who rescues his people. In this second section of our passage, verses 16 to 29, 21, Jesus walks on water. He performs another sign, another miracle, the fifth one, I believe. And um, we see that in verse 16, evening has come. And as Jesus had left, the disciples decide to head home. They, I suppose, twiddling their thumbs. Uh, it's all, everything's finished. So they go down to the sea, the lake, uh, which is not the biggest body of water, let's be clear. It's only about seven miles by 13 miles uh, long. And um, they get into their boat and they head back across from the eastern side to the western side, back to Capernaum, which is on the northwestern shore uh, of the, the Sea of, of Galilee. And it's, it's home to, to Matthew and Peter, Andrew, James and John. And as an aside, uh, and perhaps a relevant detail, um, the, the, uh, the name for Capernaum may well mean village of comfort, which is an interesting detail, if that's true. Uh, hold that... Uh, you know, hold that with a, you know, loosely. Um, now it was dark and the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. This again is language reminiscent of the Exodus when, uh, when with Moses, the people crossed the sea on the dry ground because a strong wind blew in Exodus 14. We read in 19, in verse 19, that they had rowed about three or four miles into the middle of the lake and they were in danger um, that that they were you know, gonna drown. They'd been rowing for hours and it was now sometimes, sometime between three and 6 a.m., the fourth watch of the night. And Jesus has seen the boat from his vantage point up on the, on the mountain. Doesn't actually say this, but we can assume this from looking at the other accounts. And he, he has no doubt been interceding for them in prayer, I can imagine. Uh, now they're facing east and they're rowing west and into the wind. 
uh, the direction of home, and suddenly they see a form coming towards them in the darkness, walking on the tops of the waves. You can picture it, can't you? Their situation was already dangerous, and now they're terrified, pursue, presuming that Jesus is a ghost, an apparition coming towards them. And they're probably trying to row a bit harder and get away from it. Um, there are a number of surprises in these verses. Firstly, the miracle, Jesus walks on top of a raging sea. Amazing. We often think of the sea as being flat, or at least I always do. But here it's clearly raging. Was he walking up and down these, this swell? And obviously we've had Storm Eunice. I don't know if anyone saw those pictures of the needles off the Isle of Wight with perhaps 120 mile per hour winds and the winds going up over these cliffs. It's incredible uh, to see that spray going so high and just the power of nature, the power of wind. It's the wind that whips up the water. Uh, incredible. And um, in, in Job 9, God is the one who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Jesus is clearly superior to Moses or any other prophet. Jesus is doing what only God can do. He is showing that he is the Lord God. Moses only walked through the sea on dry ground after God had blown uh, the water away. Here, Jesus walks on top of the sea like it's nothing. And, and then we have this coming near or passing by phrase, which is another allusion to Moses. In the Old Testament, when people are shown to a glimpse of, the, of God's glory, it is said that he, God, passes by. It happened to, to Moses um, when he was on top of the mountain. He, he asked the Lord to show him his glory. And God says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you up on the mountain. And um, he, he hides in a cave, doesn't he? And, and God passes by. There's this allusion to, to God passing by. And Jesus is the one doing the passing by. So John clearly years later is, is reading into these things that have happened. and going, ah, oh, that's what's going on. Another thing not too obvious here is, is the fear that the disciples have. They're frightened, aren't they? You think maybe why? Well, the other gospels tell us they thought Jesus was a ghost, probably already a bit concerned about their situation. Uh, they're frightened by seeing a ghost as well. And then in verse 20, Jesus says, it is I, don't be afraid. Not quite sure what the NIV says. Again, this is uh, initially isn't too clear, but this statement is, a, is an identity statement. Jesus is saying the I am who I am, that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus 3. So John's gospel has a number of these I am statements, as I'm sure many of you are familiar. But this is perhaps the most veiled. It's not so clear, this one. Uh, and the I am is, is how God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord, the God of rescue, relationship, faithfulness, trustworthiness, love, mercy, and grace revealed himself through this name. And Jesus uses it in passing. But he uses it to go, I am don't be afraid. So this, this sign is, is, is powerful and, and terrifying, vis vis visible demonstration of, of Jesus' sovereignty over the created world. This shouldn't be a surprise if we read John 1.1. Jesus created it. Um, this must mean Jesus is the creator himself, the fact that he does this. Uh, this is not something Moses would have ever done. Jesus is showing himself to be equal with God. And this, he then says this, do not be afraid. It is understandable that they were afraid with all that's going on. And first the storm and then this, the ghost, they must never have been out of Jesus' sight. He must have had so much concern and love for them to walk to them. And the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. He cares so much for his people. Now, he stills their fears, doesn't he? With just a few words. And the result in verse 21, they are glad to have Jesus with them. They're glad to be in his presence. There's joy. 
And here we get another miracle because there's a multiplicity of miracles, aren't there? Immediately, they arrive safely at the place of comfort at Capernaum. So miracle, walking on water, miracle, storm seems to stop. Uh, miracle, they immediately get to the place. There's a lot going on. And in the other gospels, we, we get the bit with Peter trying to walk on the water as well. So multiple miracles. So Jesus brings rescue. To have Jesus with us removes fear. It brings comfort, joy, and peace. And one day he will guide us to eternal comfort across the treacherous sea of death. I think sea is often a picture of death and chaos in the Bible. And I think that is a bit partly what's going on here. So first, Jesus has shown them who he is. Now he tells them who he is. Jesus is superior to Moses, isn't he? He's, he's not just a prophet. Islam is wrong. Um, Jesus is the Lord who rescues his people. He removes fear, brings joy and comfort. And this brings me to my third point and the last section. Jesus is the bread of life in 622 to 36. Jesus is the bread who gives eternal life. Now, in the third section of our passage, 22 to 36, Jesus tells the crowd that he is the bread of life, the true bread. Now, look down in 22. The next day, the crowd have no idea what's going on. There was only one boat and no Jesus. They know that much. Uh, in 23, people come from Tiberias, which again is on the, the western side. Um, and the people, they want to see Jesus again. So they seek him in 24 and they go to the place where he's most likely to be, which is Capernaum, where his ministry is based. Perhaps there's an application for us here, just a little one. Have you sought out Jesus? Have you really sought him? Do you seek him? Do we seek him regularly if we're Christians? Because if we seek him, we find him. Do you want to find Jesus? It's a good challenge, isn't it? Sometimes we just don't want to get close to Jesus because of the reality of what it might mean. And in 25, they looked for him and they found him. Yet their question is the wrong one. Rabbi, when did you come here? Is that the question you would ask? Maybe it is. Maybe they see something strange has happened. But they call him rabbi, not Lord, and simply want to know his travel plans. That seems a bit strange to me. Um, but perhaps they are thinking something miraculous has gone on. Maybe there's a bit of chatter. In verse 26, Jesus sees, he sees through them, doesn't he? He sees their heart, and he comes out with one of those fantastic, truly, truly phrases, saying, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, back in 2.23, uh, many believed in Jesus' name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Here, it seems that they have seen the signs, even tasted them, but they still don't believe in Jesus. They only want more bread. So it would seem seeing isn't believing from these verses. Many people say, you know, if I only saw Jesus, if I only saw God come down, I'd believe. No, no, they wouldn't. We need miracles to believe in Jesus. Even if we, we received miraculous bread, we wouldn't necessarily believe in Jesus. Just like the manna that the uh, Israelites received in the desert. Miracles don't necessarily bring belief. And there's another application, isn't there? Jesus sees our hearts too. Do we seek Jesus? Or do we only seek Jesus when we're hungry, when things are tough, when we need him, and the rest of the time we forget about him? This brings another question. What, what does Jesus seek? Well, in chapter 530, Jesus has told us that he seeks not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus then says in, in verse 27 of our passage, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Really important verse, isn't it? Now Jesus is saying, talking a bit about work. We've had a bit of that in John chapter 5. He 
He's talking about eternal life. He talks about the Son of Man, which is, I believe, the, the name that Jesus gives himself the most. Most, reference, most references where Jesus talks about himself, he calls himself the Son of Man. And it links to, back to Daniel 7, this picture of, of a figure who is both divine and human, who approaches God because he's sinless. And here we're told that it's the Son of Man, Jesus, will give you some sort of food that endures to eternal life. Now, now what does bread do? It feeds. You've had that, feeding the 5,000. Without bread, you go hungry. And eventually, if you don't eat, you die. So in effect, bread gives life. And here God has set his seal. God has authenticated on the reality of the gift of eternal life. And he said, it's guaranteed by God. This, this bread, this food that Jesus, the son of man will give you, will give you eternal life, guaranteed by God. And they ask in 28, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Isn't there a bit of a to and fro with questions? And here we've got the classic, what must I do? It happens in various places in the Gospels. People, often religious, often self-righteous, come to Jesus and go, what do I need to do to get to heaven, essentially? And they misunderstand their own sin and their need for forgiveness. But they also misunderstand that eternal life is, is not something that can be achieved, but it can only be received by faith. No one can earn it. This is Christianity 101. We need to receive a gift. You can't earn a gift. So in 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So we're to believe in Jesus. That's the work we're to do. If we're to do anything, it's belief. It's to believe. You can't work for eternal life. For salvation is a gift. But here Jesus says, what we must do the work we must do is believe and it is specifically believe in him whom was sent jesus that gets us to verse 30 We're nearing the end of the the, the the passage then what sign do you do they ask him what sign does he do that we may see and believe you what work do you perform we get this works signs thing you know, what have they been doing? What, you know, what's been going on? This shows where they're coming from, doesn't it? They don't believe, but more than that, they're choosing not to believe, it seems. There's been so many signs. We've just had feed, this miraculous feeding of 5,000 people. If they've heard about Jesus' crossing of the sea, plus this healing back in, in chapter five of the paralyzed man, the, the, the water into wine at Cana, plus all the other miracles we've seen, the, the official son, there's so many signs. And Jesus has said earlier in 536, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. He's done so much and they won't see it. Our, and they say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And they quote the Old Testament. They're actually quoting potentially a number of places, maybe Psalm 78, Exodus 16, Nehemiah 9, loads of places. And if you read those verses, it's very interesting. Here's a bit of, I'll, I'll just skim through Psalm 78. It's a long psalm, but I'll skim, skim a few verses. Verse 1, give, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. 7, they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. 11, they forgot, forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. 18, they tested God in their hearts by demanding the food they craved. His anger rose against Israel, 22, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power, 24. And he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven, 25. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance, 29, and they ate and were filled, for he gave them what they craved. 32, in spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. 38, yet he being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity. 
and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often. 53, he led them in safety so that they were not afraid, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. Amazing links to this section. And Nehemiah 9 and, and also Exodus, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, and after the feeding of the 5,000 earlier, we see that Jesus was thinking what, what Jesus was thinking and doing. I sort of alluded to this. In 6.35, Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus goes from the physical bread to the spiritual bread. Jesus is saying, unlike physical bread that sustained us for a short time before we feel hungry again, Jesus is saying that he is the source of spiritual nourishment. Later on in John 6, 6, 6, uh, disappointed that Jesus isn't the political or military leader, the king, you know, they wanted to make him king, didn't they? Um, the person who will give them food and free them from the Romans, they leave in their droves. Because they're not really listening to Jesus. They've got this idea of who Jesus is and not, aren't really listening to what they really need. You see, Jesus is the bread who gives eternal life. So in conclusion, we are to believe in Jesus. He gives us what we truly need, eternal life. He gives us rescue. We have seen that Jesus is the prophet who is greater than Moses. Moses, who at the time of the Passover, God used to, uh, during the Exodus uh, to bring deliverance from slavery. He's showing God's power over creation through the parting of the Red Sea and the miraculous feeding uh, with manna, where God showed his supernatural power. You see, Moses was a rescuer and a provider. And our section points to another rescuer, not Moses, but Jesus. Jesus is another provider who miraculously feeds 5,000. It also seems that this section is pointed to another rescue, not a rescue from Egypt and the slavery there, but the rescue from slavery to sin. Jesus is the God of of compassion and power who has entered our world who can provide food like that who is is he the promised prophet yes jesus isn't just someone who has come to perform miracles and fill our bellies amazing as that is you see we we need all sorts of things in life don't we shorter waiting lists lower prices perhaps russia not to invade ukraine um, certainly those tensions to subside and, and good to, it's good for us to pray for all of those things we need money we need a job rest energy quiet answers perhaps food water shelter purpose healing it's it's good and right to pray to god about all of these things but Jesus' first concern is our relationship with god what Jesus wants us to know about anything else is above anything else, how we can have a good and right relationship with God. You see, the three points I had, Jesus is the prophet like Moses who provides abundantly. Jesus is the Lord who rescues his people. Jesus is the bread who gives eternal life. This is what this section is saying. Jesus is the one by which we have a right relationship with God. Jesus gives you what you really need, what you really need today. Trust him, receive spiritual satisfaction and joy. Jesus is the one to believe in. He provides all. He removes fear and gives eternal life. Now, if you don't believe in Jesus, I don't know where anyone is. I don't know anyone who's watching online. I don't know if anyone believes in Jesus, but that is the challenge. You know, if you died today, would you be right with God? Are you trusting in Jesus? Have you listened to his words or have you disregarded him? In John 3, 14, it says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is the way to have eternal life. He was lifted up on a cross to die for our sin. 
and 336 says this whoever believes in the son has eternal life you have it already if you believe in jesus you have it whoever does not obey the son shall not see life but the wrath of god remains on him so there is a challenge to obey so believe in jesus listen to him he provides what you really need giving you rescue and eternal life now it is so easy to both finish listening to a talk and even giving that talk and forget it later that day or week. So let's take a moment, a few seconds, to have a little look over the passage, everything we've read, perhaps is something that struck you, and, and, and hold on to the thing that God is speaking to you about, the thing that will feed, it, feed you this week. What is God telling you this morning through his word? Let's listen and hold on to it. I'll just give you a few a few minutes and then I'll, a few seconds and, and then I'll pray. Let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from John. Um, so rich, so much in here, Lord. Um, we thank you that we have these words in a language we can understand, that we have your word, the Bible. We thank you that if we believe we have your spirit who helps us understand it. And we thank you for these truths, that, that Jesus is the prophet like Moses who provides abundantly. He is the Lord who rescues his people and he is the bread who gives eternal life. We thank you that in Jesus, we have abundance, we have rescue, we have eternal life. Help us to learn what it is you want us to learn from these verses. Help us to be changed by them and that throughout this week, we might remember these things, that we might share these truths with others so that others might trust in Jesus and receive eternal life. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.